Hello, and uh, thank you for joining us for our first Tertulia of the 2022-2023 uh, academic year. We've been on a bit of a hiatus, so we're excited to come back with, uh, with this series of, of, of interesting books. Um, my name is Christy Elaine. I'm from St. Thomas University, and on behalf of our organizers, Tracy Glynn, also from St. Thomas, Matthew Hayes from St. Thomas University, and Daniel Tubb from the University of New Brunswick, uh, we thank you for joining us. I'd like to acknowledge that the that uh, the organizers for this event are on stolen Willistoquay territory that are, of course, structured by capitalist modes of accumulation and dispossession that help shape the colonial relations on this land. And uh, I'm hopeful that tonight, a talk like tonight's talk will help us uh, think about those issues a little bit more. We'd also like to thank our sponsors for the event tonight, Fernwood Press. Um, the NB Media Co-op and Milda's Pizza. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tracy to introduce tonight's speakers. Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm happy to be able to uh, to introduce uh, David Thomas and Belden Coburn. Uh, so they're with us tonight to to discuss uh, their co-edited book, <laughs> uh, Capitalism and Dispossession: uh, Corporate Canada at Home and Abroad. Um, so this is an edited collection that that brings together uh, uh, various case studies to, to highlight the, the role of Canadian corporations uh, in in producing uh, conditions of dispossession both at, at home uh, here on Turtle Island and, and abroad. And uh, uh, I'm honored to have a, a chapter in this book uh, and uh, to be among the, the authors, uh, many who I've, I've worked with in the past and others that are just uh, folks that, that I admire. Um, uh, so that, yeah, this book um, uh, does a great job of uh, presenting uh, um, uh, yeah, processes of dispossession, not as, as, as the, uh, the book's description says, not as instances of exceptional greed or malice, um, but as, as inherent consequences of contemporary capitalism and, and settler colonialism. Uh, so David Thomas is an associate professor in the Department of P Politics and International Relations at Mount Allison University um, on the unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq and Wolstogwe peoples uh, in Sackville. Uh, and his teaching uh, and research interests focus on, on the role of, of Canadian actors abroad and on international political economy. Uh, he also has, has a book, uh, I believe it's published by Fernwood too, on, on Bombardier, that is also um, a great book that we've also uh, launched in Fredericton uh, a few years ago. Um, Belden Coburn um, is an assistant professor at the University of Ottawa's Institute of Indigenous Research uh, and Studies. Uh, Belden is Anishinaabe, a member of the Algonquins of, um, uh, I'm going to say this wrong, so maybe Belden, do you want to say the name of your community? Sure, it's Pickwaknagon. Thank you. Um, so Veldin's primary research uh, fo uh, focuses on Indigenous politics and policy in, in Canada with uh, a particular emphasis on political and economic theory. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to, to David and Veldin. Well, great. Um, Veldin, I'll go. Do you want me to go first and then I'll pass Sure, go on. ahead, Dave. Thanks okay. for that, Tracy. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Tracy. And, and thank you so much to the organizers for having us. Uh, it's uh, great to be here. Um, and and uh, Tracy just mentioned I, I did a book launch in Fredericton a few years ago. Uh, and uh, I'd kind of forgotten about that. It was in the before times. We actually had a, we all were all in the same room. And then we even went out for a beer afterwards and something to eat. It was really, really nice. And dinner uh, at, at Susan's place before the event. Um, so it's always great to uh, talk to the people in Fredericton. Um, so anyways, what I thought I would do is I'm going to, uh, speak a bit generally about the book and then I'll give kind of a couple of examples of the chapters in the second half of the book um, and as I'll get to in a second that's the half of the book that I was focusing on on and working with um, so and then and one of those will be one that I co-authored with Tyler Shipley I'll just say a couple of things about that um, and then we'll pass it over to, to, to Belden. Um, so first of all uh, so I said thanks to the organizers, uh, organizers of this event but I always say big thanks to the folks uh, at Fernwood Publishing, who I've had you know really good experience with, uh, both this book and the and and the book before. Um, I worked with Errol Sharp as the the main editor that I was working with there, who was fantastic. Um, but I also worked with Candida Handley, 
it anymore, but I worked with her in the initial stages of the, the book and the creation of the book proposal, which was really super important because I had never worked on an edited collection like this before. And she was the one who really set me on the right path and really told me what, what to do and how to conceive of um, a, a collection like this and how to go about contacting authors and, and gathering people together to make a coherent collection. Um, so big, big thanks to her. And then all the people right, right through to, to production and, and marketing and everything, they, they do a wonderful job there. I also just wanted to um, uh, say thank, uh, you know, put in a big thanks at right at the beginning for to all the contributors of the book, obviously. Um, so uh, we were we were very lucky to have um, some really amazing people contribute to this book. Um, and one of them here is Tracy. She mentioned this this earlier, and not just their the, the contribution of their own chapter, um, but I I said this at a previous event that oftentimes the contributors themselves shape the content of uh, other parts of the book. So just to give you an example of that, um, I asked Tracy early on in the process if she would like to contribute a chapter, and she said yes. But then I had someone else in mind who I said, Tracy, what about this person? Do you think this would be a good person? And she said yes. For sure, you should ask them, you know. And then, so then I went and approached that person, and 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 Tracy passed on their contact information. And then that person set me on to uh, Jennifer Moore, who who co-authored the chapter on Canadian mining in Guatemala. And then Jennifer Moore pulled in two of her kind of friends and colleagues in to co-author that chapter. So the even the contributors themselves did did a lot of work in terms of uh, uh, shaping. Uh, the book so so thanks to Tracy and and the others um, and uh, so about the book itself um, we started working on this book in uh, 2019 and uh, at first it was following on a long-standing interest that I've had in looking at the role of Canadian corporations overseas um, so I wrote this book Tracy mentioned on Bombardier which I looked at three case studies of high-speed rail projects that Bombardier has been involved with uh, in the past, and um, and then I had done some other work on Canadian mining companies abroad and whatnot. Um, and uh, one thing that I that I that I started realizing was <clears throat> that a lot of the um, a lot of the literature that focuses on Canadian corporations abroad really does so without without looking at what Canadian companies are doing in Canada and how it might be similar or different or making the connections between the two. There's sort of a body of literature that talks about Canadian corporations abroad, and then another body of literature that, that's sort of Canadian political economy stuff, with some notable exceptions. There actually are a couple of people doing, that are making these connections really well. So that's what I was getting after with the edited, the edited volume. So the idea was to um, collect case studies of Canadian corporations in Canada, and that's the first half of the book that Velden uh, was overseen and that Vivelden will talk more about. And then the second half of the book looks at Canadian corporations, case studies of Canadian corporations abroad. And then Velden and I tried in the introduction and the conclusion to start weaving some of the themes together uh, that, that we see in each, uh, in, e in each side of the book. So that's generally speaking the, the, the kind of the idea behind the book. But some of the kind of bigger questions that, that motivated me and motivated us, I think, when we were putting it together, brought some very broad questions like, you know, under capitalism, where do our profits and wealth come from? Uh, and in particular, uh, sh should this be troubling us? Um, then from there, what role do Canadian uh, uh, corporations play in, in processes of accumulation and dispossession? And what role does the Canadian state play in facilitating those processes? Um, and then finally, with this book, what, how are the local and global cases related or connected? And we will, we can talk a bit more about that in, in, in a little while. So um, the, uh, 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 the, one of the keys to the entire book that, and the way that we saw it from the beginning was that um, we didn't want to view these cases or the corporations involved in the cases um, as uh, a few bad apples. Right, just one or two or a handful of corporations behaving badly, right? So uh, not isolated cases, but rather um, uh, an inevitable result of global capitalism, right? So the violence and, and dispossession in the cases is not uncommon or unexpected, but instead part of the very fabric of an economic system that does not value people 
was the first, kind of the first thing that we were trying, uh, trying to, to do. Uh, second thing we were trying to do was to bring together um, a variety of sort of theoretical approaches or lenses in, in the cases. So we do have some sort of traditional political economy approaches like David Harvey's idea of accumulation by dispossession in some of the chapters, but we also um, rely on uh, feminist interventions, analyses of settler colonialism and other forms of colonialism abroad, um, and issues of race and racism. So there's different, and you'll see this in the book, and, and I'll give you a couple of examples of this later, um, people bringing you know, slightly different theoretical lenses uh, to, to the cases and to, and to the book in general. Um, and the other thing um, that, that I was kind of thinking at the, at the beginning, and I think we did an okay job of, is when, um, when collecting the, the cases, um, and this was, again, the, the person at Fernwood really helped me a lot with this, instead of sort of a shotgun approach where you just have a call for papers and then all these things come in and you try to try to do something with them. Um, what she suggested is that think carefully about what kind of cases you wanna have and then go and find the people who can, who can bring you those cases, find the people who are doing work on, 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 those, on those cases. So for example, in the second half of the book that I was overseeing, um, just to give you one example of this, I wanted there to be, um, cases in at least a few geographic areas of the world, right? So we, so in the end, we got we have a case in Burkina Faso in West Africa, we've got Tracy's case in Indonesia, and then we've got a case in, uh, in Guatemala. Um, the other thing was I want to find cases, um, and, and this is similar in, the, in Belden's side of the book, and he can talk about this if he'd like to, but in Belden's side of the book, we wanted to pull cases together. So we have a, a, the case of the Alton Gas, um, uh, the resistance to the Alton gas case uh, in Nova Scotia. I also want to bring in a case that, that dealt with the Arctic. So we have Re Rebecca Hall's chapter. Um, and, then, and then I thought the, the Grassy Narrows case that Belden worked on in his chapter that he'll talk about, I thought that was a really important case that, that just absolutely had to be in the book. Um, and, then this, the, and then a case out in, in Western Canada, the Fish Lake case uh, that we had a couple authors uh, wor working on. So, um, the other kind of goal of collecting the cases was that um, we want to open up a space for people to tell the stories of corporate uh, Canadian corporate dispossession and to bring together uh, scholars, activists, journalists, people with NGO experience, of kind of people from multiple walks of life to tell these stories. Um, and in addition, bringing people, people who have been doing this work on the ground in the, in the places that, that, that we're talking about. People who are involved in the political struggles inherent in, in the cases. So we do have you know, some, some, some academics uh, contributed to the book, but like I said, we also have people outside of academia who are either activists, journalists, NGO workers, who have years of experience engaging in the kind of real political struggles taking place within the cases that, that, uh, that we dealt with in the book. Um, so just for example, the case I mentioned in, of Canadian mining in Guatemala, Jennifer Moore is one of the, one of the authors of, of that chapter, and she has a, a wealth of knowledge from uh, working with Mining Watch Canada and has been in deeply, deeply involved in that, in that case in Guatemala for many, uh, for many years. And then the, the co-author she pulled in similarly uh, had had long-standing interest in this case and spent time uh, in, the, in, the, in the location. Um, so the other thing about finding the authors was I also we also wanted to find people who could present the stories in an accessible way and, and who can also locate their work within broader structures, whether that's capitalism, racism, uh, patriarchy, settler colonialism, or, or, or whatever the case may be. Now I'll just give you, I'll give you um, a few examples of the chapters in the second half of the book that look at the Canadian corporations abroad, because um, that's the half that I was uh, that I was focusing on. So one I'll mention is a, a chapter by uh, uh, Sakura Saunders. Um, her chapter is called Barrett Gold, the University of Toronto and the Corporate Capture of, of the Canadian Government. So um, Sakura is a longtime um, uh, activist around issues of mining and justice abroad and, and, Can and Canadian corporations. And what she does in this chapter is the, we put it the first one in the second half because it really sets the scene for for the second half of the book. What she does in this chapter is highlights the the history. Of the 
Canadian civil society actors trying to build a framework to hold Canadian corporations, mining corporations in particular, accountable for their abuses abroad. So she goes back to the early 2000s and works right, right to present and, and tries to look at um, this uh, a process whereby civil society tried to sit down with the, the corporate sector and, and government um, through these roundtables and come up with a way that Canadian corporations could be held responsible and accountable for, for what they're doing abroad. And she documents painstakingly, and I think very accurately, how that process was essentially derailed by corporate interests. And the result of that process was basically business as usual. The result of that process was the creation of an ombuds person office, which has essentially done nothing to hold Canadian corporations accountable, mining corporations in this case, uh, accountable. So she, she, you know, cause she, she is very much a person who's been involved in this struggle and trying to push the Canadian government um, to create mechanisms of accountability. And she kind of documents very carefully how this has failed uh, over the years. A second chapter in that, in the, in the, in, in this half of the book is the one I mentioned about Canadian mining in, in Guatemala. And this is uh, Jennifer Moore, Charlotte Connolly, and, and Karen uh, Wiesbart. And their chapter is called uh, Qualifying as Canadian, Economic Diplomacy, Mining, and Racism at the Escobar Mine in Guatemala. And this is a really excellent case study of, Can of a Canadian mining project in Guatemala um, that the go government of Canada either directly supported or tried to distance itself from, depending on the circumstances. And so they use this term economic diplomacy to talk about how the Canadian government uses the foreign service to, to grease the wheels, so to speak, between foreign governments and our corporations so that our corporations can gain a foothold uh, and, and, and in this case, build, build, build a, a mine. Um, and the, the, one of the things you'd see in this chapter is that I mentioned before this, this, this questions of race and racism. And this is one of the connections we make between the, the, the local and the, and the overseas cases. One thing she looks at in this, or the, they, the three of them look at in this, in this chapter, is that the, the Canadian officials in the Canadian state would often deploy um, racist tropes to, uh, to describe, uh, in particular, indigenous resistors to the mining project in, in this part of Guatemala. So they would kind of they would they would draw upon what um, elites within Guatemala itself would say about these people to try to discredit their opposition to the mine. So you know things like they don't really understand if they just took the time to understand the benefits of the mine, they they wouldn't oppose the mine. Um, they're easily bought off by by NGOs or whatnot, and all these kind of other ways that they try to try to, to delegitimize. Um, the very real and legitimate resistance to the to to a mining project in this case, um, the Esco the Escobar uh, project. And as I said before, all three of those authors have you know first hand experience with this case and a long standing interest in in mining in, in Guatemala and Latin America and in uh, more more broadly. So the last case I'll just mention quickly is a uh, uh, and the last the last chapter I'll mention quickly is a chapter that uh, I co-authored with Tyler Shipley. And it's on uh, banking, Canadian banking, Canadian banking interests in uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. And this was a, a bit of a newer area for me, um, so I really kind of leaned heavily on on Tyler's expertise in this uh, in, in this field of uh, of study. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, Tyler Tyler uh, wrote a, a really fantastic book that was published by Fernwood in 2020 called Canada in the World: Settler Capitalism and the Colonial Imagination which has really become, you know, one of the go-to books in terms of thinking about, uh, uh, critically thinking about Canada's role uh, in, in the world. So um, just real quickly, though, what we do in this chapter is we look first historically at how Canadian banks, some of the, most of the Canadian big banks, gained um, a foothold in Latin American and the Caribbean in the, in the banking interest. And, the, and what we found was that there were two two ways that this happened. One is was through um, British colonialism, and the second was through uh, American imperialism in the in the region. So, if you go back to the late nineteenth century, um, the uh, <clears throat> pardon me, the Bank of Nova Scotia 
uh, in, in Jamaica in 1889. And this was at a time of British, British colonial uh, Canada, as you know, part of the British Empire at the time, was able to use their, their and, and gain access to colonial markets in other parts of the world, in this case in, in Jamaica. A little bit later than that, um, Canadian banks start, start gaining a foothold in places like uh, Cuba and Dominican Republic. So um, uh, Dominican uh, 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 Royal Bank uh, sets up in Cuba in 1898. Uh, um, and then uh, not long after that in the uh, Dominican Republic, uh, shortly after US occupation of Dominican Republic in, in, in 1916. Um, so this is, this is how it all started for the big Canadian banks, right? They, they used their allies, in this case, the United States and, and, uh, and, and, and Britain to make their way into these markets uh, and get preferential access into, into these markets. Um, and then we kind of bring it to the more contemporary uh, era where we see countries like Canada very actively um, uh, supporting uh, the World Bank and the IMF and other powerful states in prying open banking markets in Latin America and, and the Caribbean. So uh, most of you know that in, in, in Canada, the banking sector is uh, heavily regulated and, and highly protected by the Canadian state, and it always has been. Right, so we protect our our big our big banks and shelter them from foreign competition to to an extent. Um, so while we do that at home, what we're doing overseas is compelling countries to privatize their banking assets, to deregulate their banking sectors sectors, and surprise surprise, one of the key beneficiaries of that is Canadian is the Canadian banking sector, right? Because then we can move in. In the late in the 1990s, for example, when when the when banks are being uh, uh, privatized and deregulated in 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 Latin America, Canadian banks can move in and become uh, e even bigger actors. And so, by 2004, we point out that um, uh, Scotia, Scotia Bank stood as the leading bank in the Caribbean and, and and Central America, at least twice the size of any other bank in that region at that time. By 2004, just to give you a sense of the dominance of Canadian banks uh, in, in the region. And we kind of end the chapter by, by um, um, uh, two ways. By one, saying that um, many of those Canadian banks will, put, will pick up and leave if, if they're at any sign of trouble. So after the, the economic uh, problem and crisis in 2008, 2009, you, you've seen a, a, a bit of a pullout. Um, so, so, and again, I mean, this isn't news to anyone, but, but but banks are there to make money. Um, and when they're not making money, they'll just up, up and leave. They're not there first and foremost to, to pr provide banking services to people or to help uh, people. And then we also kind of give a shout out to some of the very um, contemporary and cutting edge work being done on public banking and public banking systems at the very end and argue that there are alternatives um, to, to the reliance on, on, on big banks like this. So anyway, I'll stop there and uh, and pass it over to uh, to Veldon to talk about um, his work and and uh, his part of the book as well. Thanks, Dave, and uh, good evening to everyone. I see uh, Matt Sears came out this evening. You guys let him out in <laughs> these parts of the world. Um, it's been a while, so I'm just rising. Uh, yeah, I I. To say a little bit more too about going back, back to the origins of the book, it, it's mostly the brainchild of, um, of of Dave. So as we were speaking back in the summer of 2019, we got to know each other over social media, and he initially asked me to to do a chapter with him, uh, or at least a, a contribution. But then it grew into uh, a few more contributors, and we divided up the work that he would do the international part or the parts that are uh, you know Canada abroad and I would do the internal sort of colonialism aspects of the role of the Canadian state sort of jumping into bed with uh, organized capital. For me, it, it, you know, it was kind of personal. Um, I am Indigenous. I'm from a little small reserve that's about an hour and a half from where I am. I'm in Ottawa. And uh, but also uh, I hadn't really written on the Ojibwe because the other half of my family, and though I'm not biologically descended from them, just, uh, just through a mixed family, they're also, um, they're Ojibwe and they're from Grassy Narrows, and I can't even pronounce the name of what, what they go by, but um, uh, it's, I, I left it as Grassy Narrows, and it's actually two Indigenous communities, 
most people already know the the story or at least those with their that are attuned to environmental issues because it's one of the more significant environmental disasters in Canadian history often covered up though so it's um, typically grassroots moves with some small mini documentaries done by uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation visiting Grassy Narrows over the decades that we discover in around 1970. The extraordinary uh, uh, conditions of the English Wabagoon River system uh, around the two reserves that had just been relocated, although they were still sort of on the same water system, it part of the watershed that fed into the uh, the um, uh, English Wapagoon River system. That's the uh, pulp and paper plants in Dryden, Ontario, had been dumping very quietly, uh, and though at the time not even illegal, uh, up to 10 tons of untreated mercury. And then when it's in whatever chemical processes, like biochemical as well, because it's uh, bacteria in the environment that transform it into methylmercury, which becomes, it's a neurotoxin as well. It gives rise to Minamata disease, named after the location over in Japan, where uh, 1940s, I believe, it was discovered uh, about 4,000 individuals. So it's, it's quite debilitating physiologically and cognitively as well. So you would have tremors, loss of uh, control of uh, through the muscular, nervous system as well and part of my family has been aff afflicted by this in, in fact and, and i don't really typically go into my personal background when i talk about it but i thought like at this particular point i would uh, do some work because being algonquin write about algonquin all the time and not that the grassy narrows folks need much more help but they can always use a little bit more help they're they're fine leading their own but to tell the story uh of what you know, although it's not been attributed to, say, my sister's death, but she died very young. She was born with um, severe debilitations, um, and she passed away at age five when I was six years old. So we were very probably the closest siblings up until then, um, uh, close like relationally, anyways. Like um, uh, we were just a great apart. Was you know, on my other side of the family, I have a, a lot of older siblings, but. I wanted to tell the story, and it's been told a million times before, but in terms of a, a critique of capitalism, and as Dave mentioned, we do adopt the uh, more contemporary sort of spin that David Harvey gives from his work on the new imperialism on uh, the inclinations of capital to further dispossess. Uh, it's the failures of capital reproduce itself. It just goes around and... and Recycling is the nice, nice, generous word, but it's recycling their actions of the initial theft of the uh, primitive accumulation. So Dave had done the work before. So the, the work kind of, or the book is inspired sort of at the cross nexus of Dave's last book and uh, a little bit of Glenn Coulthard's book on uh, red skin, white masks, rejecting the uh, politics of recognition where he looks at a little bit of, um, like, I mean, he starts speaking to several philosophers and theorists, Hegel and Marx being one of them, and, and saying that this process in, in the colonial situation in Canada, anyways, distinguishes it from the regular anti-capitalist analysis that um, the initial moment of the transition, wherever you may be, like, it just could be like small villages at any particular time in, in medieval England for the enclosures throughout their sort of leap forward where they're violently shuffled off the land. Most cases for the purposes of proletarianization, which don't really happen with indigenous peoples, they're never really absorbed or still, if you know anything about their uh, labor market participation and the uptake is in these particular back country reserves where we are, it's not meant to be uh, developed in terms of our uh, human capital for the usage in for the exploitation sorry i should not just the usage but the exploitation in the mode of production uh from the transition from one economic system to another but uh in the same way that uh those living in the countryside of medieval england might have been shuffled off into uh urban centers or the urbanization of other centers for for the purposes of becoming workers and um their labor to be bought and sold 
but here it is the ongoing dispossession and nowhere is this more evidence, I think, uh, and, and the violence of it too. Although Glenn Coulthard says, well, it might not always be violent, but the dispossession is ongoing still here. It's that that it's not quite a mythical moment, but it is the way that, uh, as Dave and I point out, well, it seems that way through Adam Smith. He just sort of talks about it as that like, well, we had to privatize things at first, take everything that belonged to the commons and divide it up and then put it back into circuits of capital production. Never really going over quite what Marx says and what David Harvey kind of brings into the contemporary mode. So he looks at the financial crisis in, in some later books because the new imperialism predated the financial crisis of about four or five years. Looking at it and saying, well, you know what, they were just, um, the financialization of assets such as mortgages made it possible to take back assets and then resell them back into a new market constituted by the same people who are now homeless and who eventually have to like rebuy back homes. Uh, it's an ongoing process. So uh, deliberately baking into these things. And as Tracy said at the outset, these are not um, exceptional. These were rather part of the process as well. Uh, that the crises of capitalism were, well, capitalism, as Rosa Luxemburg pointed out, requires these crises. So they're manufactured in a way to repossess things because capitalists are lazy. They want something for nothing. And the initial theft um, is the best way to get it. And what they did with it with Indigenous peoples, as the chapters point out, is, is exactly that. And within l kind of living memory, it's not something that happened 500 years ago. Um, and to use the, the example where I want to modify the analysis was with water as though, sure, for the folks of Grassy Narrows, the Ojibwe, Northwestern Ontario, and those particular two First Nations, yes, they were relegated to very small Indian reserves. And throughout the uh, course of the chapter, it's, it's historical in some part, but I bring it up to the, the present, is challenging the idea, well, of course, most of us are onto it, is uh, the familiar story that uh, Canada's celebrated scholar of Canadian political economy, Harold Innes, saying, well, you know what, we've always been regarded as the hewers of wood and drawers of water. So we're doing the hard work for the rest of the world. And in, in the, um, I guess, in early mid modern sort of mid stage capitalism, supplying the industrial powers around the world. So shipping out all the lumber and timber that we can. Um, and it's sort of a turn of phrase that's drawn from the Bible, but in fact, it has a lot of resonance for the folks in grassy narrows because uh, at that particular time in the late 19th century, early 20th, as it moves through to the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, that uh, that particular part of the world was exactly that. It was for uh, organized capital with new settlements, and as, and as I'll call them a little bit, the mob in the hinterland, um, there to hew the, water, hew the wood and to draw the water. Um, so we're getting at corporate dispossession. Uh, we have the establishment of these new sort of places and, uh, and not a Marxist because Hannah Arendt uh, vehemently sort of opposes the scientific humanism behind Marxism. That uh, we should be from narrative from moving one from one stage of human development to the next and therefore we can understand how um, human history unfolds. Uh, she, her critique of uh, capitalism, I, and it's almost a cliche for a political scientist these days, but part two of the origins of totalitarianism, the chapters in part two, part two being, or called imperialism, speaks almost exactly to the same trajectory and the same political actions of colonialism in Africa as what occurs in North America. So she's wrong on a few facts, but I try to do an application to Northwestern Ontario. So uh, new land ripe for the sort of, uh, as she opens up basically is ex expansion for expansion's sake and rushed by the mob, settled by those people that Europe didn't see as the elite. So in North America, we saw, especially in my parts where I live here, just outside of Ottawa and 
uh, my non-Indigenous side, we descend from some of them as the, um, the original Irish that came over here, escaping the famine. So already colonized by England, already the human debris that uh, are treated like very disposable. They're not part of even noble class if class consciousness still exists in, in England. And, and it does at that particular time. There's still some, I guess, in the uh, mid 19th century who still believe that their titles of Lord or Count or Duke or what have you, Duke being more of a, a, a title of royalty, but that they oversaw that they were Lords of the land, Lords of the manor, um, and that they, they had uh, working class peasantry and those that were close to, to death because uh, British colonialism, like indigenous peoples here, treated them as though that they were human refuse. So to live, they go up and peer, organized capital sees Northwestern Ontario as a place to uh, just ravage the territory. And by the time we get to industrialize modern technology of the craft mill, mill in, craft pulp and paper mill in Dryden, this is where I wanted to use the analysis of accumulation by contamination. So the, the section in the chapter is dispossessing the English Wabagoon waterway. Now, they, they never really take something in the same way that they coercively remove the peasantry or the indigenous peoples from the territory as the, as the other cases and, um, and as the chapters in uh, Dave's sort of half of the book that he edited um, would look like. Is, so they're already rounded up, put on a reserve, and they're left there with some traditional modes of subsistence. So their waterway, uh, that's where the individuals uh, and households and families, the whole society basically really, and I guess just as a delicacy, loves the loves the fish that come out of it's you know it's good uh, we love it too, um, and um, so they're eating it and uh, once they discover you know once the onset of like a disproportionate amount uh, or number of individuals and in grassy narrows start presenting with conditions that have only been observed in perhaps two other places in the world. Uh, the other one, I think, was Iran, and but in Minamata, Japan, is they discover, well, yeah, sure, organized capital and the state does come to its rescue through the 1970s and 80s and 90s and even in 2022, earlier this year or last year, is to come up to make up for the shortcomings of this um corporation which took the river away from the indigenous peoples they had left it there just in an unusable form so it's it's no longer you can really drink the water you can't consume fish it'll probably be like that for many lifetimes now it's been that way so i adopted a little bit of my public economics side is we know in that really um mundane language that they use to you know not attract any stigma is like well we get these negative spillovers when we have to start costing things in public finance uh it, which is basically just another way of saying well there's a negative spillover well i polluted somebody else's area um somebody else absorbed the cost and here it was with their health and their society that uh the indigenous folks of grassy narrows subsidized the profits with their lives and their, their river waste. So the, the value, um, if we were to take that sort of cold economic um, Marxist view, and it's not even like Marxist, but it's the, Marx had pointed out that um, something that might now have use, it once had used value, that used Bozal site in order for a corporation to reduce its uh, costs so to inflate its profits and once it's discovered there's a long drawn out court battles over who is responsible for this because of course it's not illegal this event itself ushers in the first environmental protection act in ontario's history i don't know if it's across canada but that gets introduced in the early 1970s as a result of this moratorium on dumping although the the dryden mill continues to dump it into the waterway a little bit, not too much, but legal wrangling. Um, and uh, the amount is settled in 1984, 85 and 86. Uh, it was a mediated settlement by a former, um, I think, justice that was appointed by the government. Uh, 
uh, to basically tell the indigenous peoples, just take this deal. And at the time, I, it was about $35 million. And if you recall, a few years ago, it was Minister Seamus O'Regan, who was a the Minister of Indigenous Services Canada, just before the, I think it was the 2019 election, fall election, that he had, so it was May, I think, in, in 2019, he was up in Grassy Narrows because they have yet to make good on even a mercury poisoning treatment center where 90% of about 1,100 individuals are living with um, the fallout to their health while the government continued. And, and this is kind of the, um, the gift that the state has done and just like the shell game between the consolidation of the modern state and closing the commons, transferring it to a private corporation uh, in this case, it had gone through several sort of companies and subsidiaries, um, uh, Great Lakes Forest products, changing hands over and over again, getting a few investment subsidies at some point, some upgrades to the Dryden Mill, um, all the while leaving Indigenous peoples to suffer, to event, to, as I said, to subsidize the profits of a corporation based upon the, the ongoing dispossession and harms that were associated with like the theft of what was theirs. So that's the law. That, sorry if I drone on too much about it, but I used Hannah Arendt just because, uh, again, she dis she discusses, she said, you know, she's basically saying that there is that voracious appetite of the, the of the capitalists at these times to go to locales that were outside the reach of lawfulness where they could treat others as human debris uh so drawing analogies to the when belden was in the congo so king leopold going in for gold and diamonds and and treating the indigenous peoples there as you know just the the horrors probably the the most barbaric historically anyways um colonialism that you can ever imagine uh like what they did to living people but some um, allowing people to now live like the entirety of li their lives because there's the uh, bioaccumulation of this methyl mercury that and it crosses the uh through the placenta into the children for it to accumulate so they are um as as fetus are developmentally I want, to, I want to be sensitive to it, like just down that they like, yeah, it compromises them in, in ways that they, they'll never have a good quality of life. And even children being born now today for the profits that were made off the theft of their, their own commons and, um, and, and may live miserable lives for, um, for the time being that, um, yeah. It's the, the transfer of of the uh, wealth from the hinterland to the centers uh, of, uh, of financial power. So I don't know. I, I haven't had a chance to talk about the rest of the chapters, but I know uh, if we're having a discussion afterward that I'd, I'd leave that open for more. So thank you. So I, yeah, I know. I just kind of wanted to honor sort of my sister and um, and other siblings on that side by bringing a little bit more a new angle of analysis to it uh, 